Hey everyone, in this video we're going to be talking about another Bible translation, the Modern English Version. In this video we're going to be looking at its background, its features, and its place in the Bible market. I've had a lot of people ask me about this translation, and it's probably taken me too long to actually get to doing this video, but here I am, so let's take a look at the Modern English Version. Looking at the background of this translation, I'm getting a lot of this information from BibleGateway.com, which says that the Modern English Version is a translation of the Textus Receptus and the Jacob Ben Hayim edition of the Masoretic Text, using the King James Version as the base manuscript. So one thing that's appealing about this translation to a lot of people is that it uses the Textus Receptus for the New Testament and uses the King James Version as the English text that it's starting from in its translation work. So for people who trust the King James Version, which is very widely used historically in the English-speaking world, that is really something that is appealing about this translation. By the way, I have done a video on the Textus Receptus versus the critical text to give some of my thoughts on that particular issue. But there are a lot of people out there who really trust the Textus Receptus and prefer it. And so this translation, I think, is really seeking to be appealing to those people. Going on, it says the modern English version is a literal translation. It is also ref often referred to as a formal equivalence translation. So this translation is seeking to be literal. And I would say, you know, on the spectrum, it's not going to be in any way over on the dynamic or functional equivalent side. It is going to be more on that formal side. But I did some spot checking just so you can get a feel for how they deal with different passages. First one I have here, and I'm comparing to the Legacy Standard Bible on the right, because that's known to be a very literal translation, is Amos 4.6, which says, Though I gave you cleanness of teeth in all your cities, and you'll see something similar in the Legacy Standard, but I gave you also cleanness of teeth in all your cities. So this phrase, cleanness of teeth, is a literal translation. They don't in any way try to make it more of an English expression. They just use the original expression there, which is talking about people not having enough to eat. Another example is Genesis 4.1, where the modern English version says, Adam had relations with his wife Eve, whereas the Legacy Standard Bible in the text says, now the man knew his wife Eve. And I think that is the more literal rendering, though you do see had relations with in the footnote in the Legacy Standard, whereas you actually see that alternate rendering in the text rather than the literal rendering when you're looking here at the modern English version. So in this case, it's not as literal. In Luke 12, 25, we read, who of you by worrying can add one cubit to his height? And that phrase, one cubit to his height, is, I think, a very literal translation there. In the Legacy Standard Bible, it says, which of you by worrying can add a single cubit? So that's literal, cubit, to his lifespan. And I think in this case, actually, the modern English is a little bit more literal than the Legacy Standard Bible, which puts height in the footnote. And then in Matthew 5, 2, it says, He began speaking and taught them, saying. Whereas in the Legacy Standard Bible, it says, He opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying. So I think here, this is a more literal rendering. He opened his mouth, whereas this renders it in English in a more expressive way. He began speaking. So more kind of conveying the general idea of what opened his mouth means. So in terms of literalness, it is trying to be more word for word, but it's not super literal. It's not maybe as rigid as some translations. It's a little bit more flexible in some ways. So it is a literal translation if you look at it on the spectrum, but not necessarily the most literal. Going on, it says that the Committee on Bible Translation began its work on the MEV in 2005 and completed it in 2014. So it is a relatively new Bible translation. As I'm recording this, the chief editor is James F. Lindsay, who conceived the MEV and is a graduate of Fuller Theological Seminary. The MEV is a modern translation by 47 translators from a wide variety of denominations. 
So that indicates there that they really tried to get a lot of people involved in this project and not make it just a project for one denomination, one theological point of view. From what I understand, though, the, the project was originally conceived for use by military chaplains, and the copyright on it is Military Bible Association. I think these were chaplains that were in England and America, and they wanted a translation that would be understandable for that use in, in that setting. And so James Lindsay, I believe, had a vision for this, and then there was a publisher who uh, came onto the project and has actually produced hard copies of this translation. So it is published and distributed now by Charisma House Publishers. So that's the background of the modern English version. Let's take a look at the features of this translation. First of all, I note that it uses capitalized pronouns for deity. So when uh, you have a pronoun that's referring to God, like he or him, those pronouns are going to be capitalized. Now that's something that a lot of conservative-minded people, theologically conservative people, really seem to like in Bible translations. The New King James has that feature. The, the New American Standard Bible has that feature. It's interesting, though, that the King James Version doesn't capitalize pronouns for deity. So that has not always been something you've seen in Bible translations in English. But in more recent years, a lot of the more conservative translations do have that feature. And so you do see it here in the modern English version. Another feature is that it retains the King James renderings of a lot of the well-known passages from the Bible. So if you look at John 3.16, for example, the modern English version sounds a lot that, like the King James version, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. People who are familiar with those passages and like the sound of them are going to like the renderings that they see in the modern English version. Another one would be Psalm 1-1, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. So when you look at it, it does have some of these traditional renderings, but another feature of this Bible is that it actually uses more of a modern style of English overall. When I've read this, it seems like it just has a very modern feel to it, quite understandable, I think, for a lot of people. That being said, it does retain some formality and even some traditional elements to the language. So for example, you're not gonna see contractions when people are speaking. At least that's not what I've observed in this translation. Uh, you're not gonna hear Jesus saying, let's go. It's gonna say, let us go. So that's a little bit more of a formal uh, way of rendering things. And another example would be uses of words like shall or the letter O for the word O, like O Lord. <laughs> so. Those are terms that I think are a little bit more traditional and formal sounding that are retained in this translation. The modern English version, another feature here is that it does use more masculine language that's reflected in the original languages. So I'll give you some examples here. In Psalm 1 verse 1, it says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Some translations are just gonna say blessed is the one, blessed is the person, but this continues to use the masculine term that is in the original Hebrew. Another example would be in the New Testament where it says, my brothers count it all joy when you fall into various temptations. Technically the word there is a masculine term, Adelphoi, and so you see it just has here's my, my brothers, whereas some translations will put my brothers and sisters because James actually is referring to the whole church there. So that is a, definitely a hot button issue when it comes to translation. And the modern English version takes a more what you would call traditional approach, more literal approach, and just goes with the masculine language that you see in a lot of passages in the original language. Another thing I've noticed about this translation is it seems to assume the textual basis of the King James Version, the Textus Receptus. You're not gonna see footnotes or brackets in any way um, questioning what should be in the text. It's just going to kind of put the text in there that was traditionally in the text in the King James Version, with one exception that I want to look at quickly here. The only exception I found to what I just said was 1 John 5, 7, and 8. You will see a footnote that says the earliest Greek manuscripts lack in heaven the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. There are three that testify on earth. And so it's basically indicating here that this shouldn't be in the text. 
even though they did put it in the text, just like the King James does. So it continues to use a lot of the King James renderings using the King James textual basis, and for the most part doesn't question that at all, except uh, from what I've seen, the only, the only exception is 1 John 5, 7, and 8. Now, I did look at this and, and notice there aren't a lot of translator notes. There are some, though, so I'll give you some examples here of some translator notes that I found. In 1 Samuel 13, verse 1, this is a text where the Hebrew is very ambiguous, and it seems like there's maybe something missing there. It says, Saul was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned for 42 years over Israel. There's some italics there where they kind of added some numbers. And so it does in the footnote talk about what it literally says in the Hebrew text. The son of a year was Saul in his ruling, and two years he ruled over Israel. So that's one translator note that you will see. Another one is in Galatians 3.22, where it talks at the uh, end of the verse here, toward the end, that the promise uh, through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Or it says here in the footnote, through the faith of Jesus Christ. So that's another example where the translators are just giving a different rendering. And then in 1 Corinthians 7.36, in this passage you see a footnote here that says some versions translate this word as virgin daughters rather than just virgin. Others, others translate it as fiancé. Since the Greek itself remains unclear, the editors have chosen to keep the literal translation. So that gives you some examples of some of the translator notes that you see in this Bible. And as I said, it doesn't look like there are a lot of translator notes, but uh, there are some here and there, as I showed you. Another thing I noticed in those footnotes is that there are uh, citations of Old Testament quotes that are in the New Testament, so you will see a footnote telling you where the passage is being quoted from in the New Testament. Also, you'll see some modern measurements in the footnotes. So there are not necessarily a lot of footnotes, but they are helpful footnotes and uh, focusing on some things that are just making the translation user-friendly rather than technical footnotes. And finally, one other feature is the use of italicized words for supplied words in English. The interesting thing about that particular feature, though, um, and I believe that R. Grant Jones actually pointed this out, it seems like it's only in the Old Testament that you'll see these italicized words. People who are used to the King James Version are used to this feature, and I think that they really prefer it. They like it. Um, so it was interesting they were going for that, and I think that was uh, something that a lot of people would like if they're used to the King James. But there's an inconsistency there. It's only in the Old Testament, not the New Testament. I also wanted to show something that I found really interesting about their use of italicized words in one particular passage. In Esther 1.1, it says here, Now in the days of Ahasuerus, also called Xerxes, and you'll notice here that it uses uh, italics for this phrase here, also called Xerxes. And I think that what you'll see in the original text, that is just not there, but they decided to put this in italics. And I'm curious why they didn't just put that in a footnote rather than adding it here in the text itself. But that is one example of how they use italics in this Bible. So I think that's just really interesting. I happen to see that. I don't know how often you would see that. I have a feeling that might even be the only case where they did something like that. In my opinion, it seems like it would have made more sense to just put that in the footnote since it's not actually in the Hebrew text. But that really shows you how uh, italics, in this case, are used in the modern English version. Mostly, though, they're just going to be using them in the Old Testament for words that need to be there to make it smoother and more understandable in English. Finally, let's take a look at this translation's place in the Bible market. I would say for those who are really King James oriented, they like the King James translation, they trust its textual basis, but they're looking for something more modern and understandable, this is really a good Bible for them. This is a translation that is going to make people feel very comfortable if they use the King James Version and they're reading this. There's not going to be anything questioning which textual basis they are using. Another 
interesting thing about this Bible in the Bible market is that it is copyright protected. So there are other translations like the World English Bible, which would be similar to this in some way, although that one I think is based on the majority text, but that's not based on the critical text. It is a lot more like this translation, and yet the World English Bible would be public domain. This one is copyright protected, which in some ways people may not like that, but in other ways it does protect the text and make sure that people are getting permission before they use it or in any way. If they were to change anything, there would be legal ramifications for that. So it does actually protect the text by it being copywritten. Also with that, there is, I think, a desire to uh, publish it and get it out there into the market. It does have endorsements and advertising, especially at the beginning uh, of its production. I think there was a lot of push for it, even on different uh, programs on television, uh, Christian television, and there were people endorsing it. You can see that on the back of the box. So they really tried to get this out there and uh, really build a market base for it. And it does have a fan base. It does have people out there that really do like this translation. And I think that's one of the reasons a lot of people have asked me about it, because they do like this translation and uh, they, they want to see it promoted. However, looking at it, I, I notice it's not really on any top 10 lists of uh, publishing. It's not showing up on the EPCA top 10 bestseller list or anything, which doesn't mean that it's not selling, but it's probably not one of the highest selling translations. And honestly, I would say the publisher could do more currently in the way of communication and promotion of this translation. At least from what I've seen, I'm not seeing a lot being talked about it, not seeing the publisher reaching out to people and uh, really trying to promote it currently. So it would be good to see kind of a renewed effort if they really want to get this translation out there. I think you can see it really has its work cut out for it. If it's going to be more widely used, it's going to take, uh, going to take a lot of effort because there's a lot of Bibles out there, a lot of Bible translations out there in the Bible market a lot for people to choose from. And so for, for you to stand out, you really have to work hard at it. That being said, it is a Textus Receptus Bible, and there certainly is a market for that kind of translation, and that is the appeal of it. So that's its background, its features, its place in the Bible market. If you have any questions about this translation, anything you want to clarify, or just something you want to mention about this Bible translation, or anything related to this topic, I'd love to see that in the comment section below. But thank you so much for taking a look at this topic with me from a fresh perspective.